Hello, welcome to the SMU video archive series. In this series, we interview people from the SMU community who can provide insights into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time at the university. My name is James Early, and with us today is Jim Gerhardt, Professor Emeritus of Political Science. Jim, when did you arrive at SMU? I came in 1974, and uh, as I recall, mm -hmm. you hired me. Is that <laughs> right? <laughs> for which I'm yeah. very grateful. Yeah. Uh, when I came, as you may remember, uh, the department, uh, political science department, had experienced something of a split, one mm -hmm. of those things mm -hmm. that happen in academic departments. Uh, so far as I could ever tell, it had little to do with disciplinary mm -hmm. issues and a lot to do with personalities and resources, mm -hmm. uh, struggle over resources. Uh, the chair was Frank Balch, and uh, I was hired to come in behind him. Mm -hmm. uh, you gave us uh, initially a, a, a year's delay on making that yeah. exchange. And in the meantime, a large and growing uh, Master of Public Administration program in the department uh, lost its uh, its real creator, Tom Michalecki, who decided that uh, it was time for him to go back to being a city manager. And the program fell into my lap the, uh, a year after I arrived. Uh, the program was large and uh, and and growing out of bounds, uh, and I hit it uh, just about the time that the that uh, all sorts of things were happening in the public sector mm -hmm. that began to squeeze down opportunities for uh, uh, people going through programs of that sort to find uh, find professional work. Uh, I found myself with uh, 60 new students and uh, a commitment on the part of the program to find part-time internships That's for all of them. That's pretty massive, 60 which was, new uh, students. 60, 60 brand new students. And uh, we found something yeah. for all of them, uh, but it was, it was not comfortable. Uh, I, I stuck with that for two years, finally got the admissions under control. Mm -hmm. uh, the 60 students had not been my responsibility. Yeah. They were my inheritance. Uh, we cut that back pretty drastically the following year. And uh, after two years of, of working with that, which were exciting times for me, uh, Frank did step down mm -hmm. from chairing the department, and, uh, and I stepped in. Uh, Jim, could I jump back for a moment and ask you something from your initial impressions of uh, SMU, you came from Rice, didn't you? Yes, I came from Rice. Uh, I was a late comer to Academe. Uh, had uh, gone to West Point and spent 11 years of commission service in the Army. But six of those 11 years were taken up with, in graduate school and a tour back teaching at West Point. And uh, it took me about two more years to make up my mind that there were, there were other things I, I needed to do with my life than uh, <coughs> uh, lead artillery batteries around uh, around the field. Uh, so I left the Army, went back to graduate school, and, and Rice was my first uh, post-degree appointment in the mid-60s. Uh, a very interesting place, a uh, terrible city to live in, although very exciting back in the late 60s, yeah. early 70s. Uh, but the climate was not <laughs> not all that favorable. And when my tenure time came up uh, at Rice, uh, I hit the uh, uh, hit the tenure decision in the same year that the Congress decided that uh, they weren't going to appropriate any more money to the Defense Department mm -hmm. for research projects that were not directly defense oriented. And Rice panicked uh, and decided. Uh, whether the, for that reason or quite possibly yeah. others as well, they just didn't need another yeah. tenured yeah. professor yeah. of political science right then. So I was on the market for uh, for two years and uh, uh, 
another year at Rice, a year at the University of Houston, and then, then came here. SMU was very different from Rice in, in many ways. Rice was a much more coherent place. Uh, they, uh, without the separate uh, schools, the extent Without yeah. the separate schools. Now that's, that has changed mm -hmm. uh, since then, but it, was, it really was one place. Uh, it did not have the uh, uh, fraternities and sororities uh, dominating uh, mm -hmm. social life as, uh, as SMU did back in the mid-70s and to considerable Some extent, extent still, uh, still, do, still does. Uh, the, uh, the students were assigned to, uh, uh, to colleges, residential colleges, and uh, uh, it was different in that respect. I had a lot more uh, science and engineering students showing up in my political science classes yeah. than, uh, than I ever had here at SMU yeah. and, and enjoyed working yeah. with them. Uh, they, were, they were usually very bright students. And uh, when they came to take political yeah. science, they came to take it because they wanted yeah. to take it. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, uh, the faculty uh, were very collegial. When I arrived at Rice, there were only four of us teaching political science. We were a rump uh, sec so segment of the history department. Yeah. So we spent our first, uh, uh, we spent my first two years there searching for someone to come and chair the department and uh, declare its independence. And that was, a, that was an interesting bonding experience too. Uh, How big was the department here when you first came? Uh, when I first came here, there must have been 12 or 13 people. Uh, fair, fairly, fairly good-sized mm -hmm. department with the, uh, uh, the public administration program. We had some uh, master's degree, master of arts degree students, um, and a very healthy undergraduate, mm -hmm. undergraduate enrollment. I remember at some time, perhaps just before you came, the department chose to drop its old name government and become political that, science. You know, that, ha that happened back in the 1960s. And uh, actually it was at one time a school of government, I think, with yeah. an endowment yeah, from, special the, endowment uh, and, from uh, the Arnold Foundation. Yeah. Uh, and as the endowment dwindled uh, in purchasing yeah. power, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the attachment yeah. to that endowment yeah. uh, altered over, yeah. over time. Uh, and. Uh, we had a we had a very eclectic department. Uh, the department uh, before I came here had decided, I think, in the late '60s, that it was not going to pursue a, uh, a PhD mm -hmm. program. And uh, I think over the long run, that was probably a mm -hmm. probably a good decision, a good pedagogical decision. It may not have been the best decision for the the, uh, the health of the department, so on, the, the funding department. of the department, and that sort of yeah. thing. But I think from, from the point of view of uh, what we could do for students, uh, it, was, it was a good decision. And as a matter of fact, both of our undergraduate programs disappeared in the early 1980s. Uh, the MA program, so far as I could tell, really never had attracted a good, strong, uh, a good, strong clientele. The public administration program- How long did that last? The MA program lasted really into the Mid '80s, I think it was when. when uh, uh, at one point, the, the then chairman said, "Well, we're going to keep it on the books, but we aren't going to recruit anybody." And then we finally just took it off the books. Uh, the public administration program uh, died in the Reagan administration. Uh, they, there had been some uh, some federal funding that was supporting uh, minority students and women students in the in the. Uh, uh, in the program, that disappeared. There was never any replacement of that that kind of funding, and eventually the program simply couldn't compete financially with uh, uh, North Texas, Arlington, uh, fairly strong programs of a similar nature there, and uh, we decided to close shop. We just couldn't recruit enough students to make it worth worth anybody's while, including the students. Uh, and from then on, from the early to mid 80s on, department focused on teaching undergraduates. Uh, 
My, in my time as chairman, I, uh, I guess the biggest frustrations, as they were across most mm -hmm. of, of the college, uh, were resources. Uh, we did have some frustrations in recruiting. Uh, the, uh, the university had a habit of freezing recruitment in the middle of the recruiting season and then opening it yeah. up again when it was too late. I understand the department just interviewed uh, <coughs> a, a couple of months ago uh, a fellow who had come here to uh, interview for a starting position and uh, we were about to hire him and the freeze okay. came. We didn't get him. He went on his way and he was back a couple of months ago uh, interviewing for, for a, a more uh, elevated for, for a much more elevated spot, right? yeah. and I don't know how that's going to turn yeah. out. I've tried to stay out stay out of that yeah. business of the department. Uh, Dennis Ippolito was my successor in in the department. Uh, he came in. Uh, I had five years chairing, and uh, I, we got a new dean, uh, Hal Williams. And uh, Hal, I think, eventually mm -hmm. decided he wanted someone in from outside uh, to chair the department. Uh, Dennis had some kind of family connection, as I remember. Dennis had a family connection. He was married to an Underwood, Nancy mm -hmm. Underwood, uh, with a strong connection to the law school. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a good reason for him to come to Dallas. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it may have been more Nancy than, than yes. Dennis who <laughs> decided to come to Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis, I think, was he was good for the department in, mm -hmm. in many ways. Uh, he, uh, his connections outside the department with the rest of the mm -hmm. college were not that good. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's I think he would agree that that was so. Um, uh, but inside the department. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, he, he did an excellent job. He was good at recruiting young people and bringing them along. Mm -hmm. He was uh, very good at managing the delicate relationships mm -hmm. between us older hands, mm -hmm. right? And the younger people, mm -hmm. uh, resources started to flow and uh, it was pretty clear that they were going mm -hmm. primarily to developing the younger faculty and, uh, and, and yet uh, Dennis treated the uh, the older faculty uh, well enough mm. that uh, that this didn't cause uh, cause too much mm. disruption. Nothing like what had happened before oh, I came here. <laughs> right. uh, and uh, uh, we uh, we really we 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 did very well under his uh, un under his uh, under his leadership. Uh, well, I have a sense the department has, uh, in terms of personnel and so on, perhaps is as strong now as it ever, ever has been. Oh, I think so. Uh, no, this has not been an, a has not been a, a smooth <laughs> line of progress, right? And I guess that's that's uh, generally yeah. generally true in in academe. Uh, we went through a very tough period in the middle '90s, uh, early to middle '90s, when. Uh, Dennis tried to uh, uh, engineer a, a transition from uh, from himself to a successor, uh, who just and it just didn't work out mm. very well. Uh, and we, at one point, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, well, let me let me right. not put it in <laughs> generalities, <laughs> right? Uh, Dennis Ippolito and some colleagues in the middle 1980s had come up with the notion of a research center as a way of raising funds to support research efforts. One of the, one of the continuing problems for the department is that we have strong expectations of research effort uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the faculty, uh, no graduate students. Mm -hmm to assist in those efforts, and uh, increasingly political science, like many of the other social mm -hmm. sciences, uh, political scientists have come to re rely right. on graduate students to uh, do a lot of the scut work that, <laughs> that, uh, that their research calls for. 
Uh, we're not as lucky as the yeah. economists. We don't. The federal government doesn't uh -huh. publish our databases, uh -huh. right? They pretty much have to. Uh, they have to be recreated. Uh, so, uh, where where was I going with this? Uh, the uh, this plan, this proposal, had sat uh, in uh, probably a bottom drawer in the mm -hmm. provost desk for a couple of years, and then John Tower who had, uh, after his term, after leaving the Senate, had come here and done some teaching, uh, died in an air crash, and uh, out of that very quickly developed the notion of the Tower Center. Uh, this became, uh, as uh, uh, sources of funding often can, became a, an object of some competition. Uh, in the department, and uh, after Dennis stepped down and Jim Brown stepped in, uh, he also put himself in charge of the Tower Center. And he was chairing the department. He was chairing the department and chairing right. the Tower Center, uh, which uh, in general I think was probably not a good idea, and in particular was, was especially not yeah. a good idea given, given the personalities yeah. there. Uh, the upshot of uh, the first round was that the dean decided Jim wasn't going to be chairman anymore mm -hmm. after two years, I think it was, and asked Dennis to resume duties mm -hmm. as chair, uh, but left Jim in charge of the Tower Center, uh, which uh, probably wasn't a very good yeah, idea yeah. either at that, at that stage. Uh, then started the process of uh, searching outside mm -hmm. for a department chair once again. Uh, this dean, Jimmy Jones, set up a search committee that included only one member of the department, and that was Frank Balch, uh, which and uh, perhaps didn't uh, go over too well with the department. <laughs> uh, didn't go over too well. Uh, there was at one point uh, pretty strong evidence that the dean. Even before we interviewed any of the people who had applied for the advertised mm -hmm. position, I uh, was about to decide mm -hmm. on a person. And at that point, uh, Dennis Ippolito said, uh, you can't do this, right? <laughs> and uh, the, uh, you know, you mm -hmm. legally you can't do this. You're going to get in trouble. The upshot was that Dennis stepped down mm -hmm. from the chairmanship. And the associate dean, then associate dean of the of the college, uh, come on, the, the Mike, uh, Best. Mike Best uh, became our chairman, yeah. right? Uh, which, uh, in a sense, turned out to be a, you know, please, Dean Jones, don't yeah. throw us into the briar patch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the search went on for for a full two years, and. Uh, in the midst of it, uh, the dean called in to a uh, very senior outside political scientist who came in and interviewed everybody and uh, wrote up a report that said to the dean mm. exactly what we had mm. been saying mm. to the dean, <laughs> which yeah. did not make him happy. Uh, and uh, uh, left behind a list of possibilities. Yeah. Uh, that fairly quickly shrank to a couple of, yeah. of alternatives, and out of that came Cal Jilson. Mm -hmm. uh, who was not the dean's pocket candidate to begin with. Was not, definitely was not the dean's pocket candidate. It was nothing like the dean's pocket candidate. And turned out to be, uh, if, we'd, if we'd known what Cal Jelson was going to do, we would have been out there, you know, shoveling money into his pockets to come. <laughs> uh, Dennis Ippolito and I both uh, concluded fairly quickly that we had never seen anybody do the job as, as well as, as Cal did in the outset. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there were things uh, happening that I was not aware of. I, I wasn't paying a lot of attention to department business at that point in my career. Uh, I was interested, but I didn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of input to offer. Uh, but what I saw went extraordinarily smoothly in uh, recruiting, in uh, uh, retiring older faculty, including eventually myself in, in 1999, 
opening up positions, finding really good, uh, good young people to come in uh, and, and fill in. And in general, uh, Cal was not your hail fellow well met. He, he kept a certain degree of dignified distance <laughs> <laughs> from the department. Uh, which I, I think was very wise, giving all, given all the change that was happening. And he also eventually uh, took over the Tower Center, uh, is along he doing with chairing that now the department. Or no, he's not doing either one. Dennis uh, is back chairing the department. Dennis is back chairing the department. Uh, I don't know what the next step mm -hmm. in that, that yeah. succession is going to be. And uh, uh, Jim Hollifield, is uh, is heading the heading the tower center, and the two of them are getting along just fine. The department is getting along just fine from all from all I can see. Uh, oh well, you know, yeah. But uh, there are those Monday mornings. <laughs> uh, well, Jim, could I shift you to your long stent, the faculty senate, in one way or another, and see you know, what you'd like to tell us about that? You know what? When I came here, I was uh, had some curiosity about the faculty senate at Rice, which was my only other, the only other place I had seen governance and yes. internal governance in a, in a, 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 a civilian university. Uh, the uh, uh, the governance body was the faculty, and they met periodically and uh, made votes on curriculum and made votes on all kind all kinds of things presided over by the president SMU was uh, a little too big mm -hmm. for that and also structurally it simply mm -hmm. it, it simply couldn't uh, couldn't work uh, so the uh, the Senate was there to express the voice of the faculty as well as any set of representatives could uh, but I was too darn busy to pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, I did get uh, hooked in by Barbara Reagan you know, when she was presiding over the Senate to chair an ad hoc committee on uh, it was very carefully named course evaluation and teaching effectiveness. Right? We were not going to evaluate right. teaching; we were going to evaluate courses. And the the the, the committee came into being because. Uh, Don Shields, then, then the president, told Barbara uh -huh. that if the faculty didn't come up with some uh -huh. way of handling this, uh, the administration the was going to. Right? So, uh, so we did it, and uh, we met for two years. Uh, I must say, I, I dawdled a bit, uh -huh. and uh, I came up with uh, what I thought in 1983. We came up with a good, uh, a good report that I think postponed for maybe 10 or 15 years the uh, administration's desire to rely on what I call the single number <laughs> approach to, <laughs> to evaluating teaching. Uh, I'm afraid we're there now or, or mm. something very, clo very close to it, uh, although I've not seen these, uh, these awful printouts that you, that you see at, uh, at big state universities that that handle thing handle things that way, uh, but we uh, we did sort of shock the Senate in setting the the premise at the outset in our report that the reason for existence of the university was to teach students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got a lot of objection to that. Too well with that. <laughs> but uh, uh, I did try to you know I did try to suggest that. You know, the rest of what the yeah. university does can be done at yeah. all kinds yeah. of other places, but teaching students yeah. is, is first and foremost yeah. well, why, why we're here. Well, that was my first experience with the faculty senate. It was not such as to persuade yeah. me I really yeah. wanted yeah. to get involved. Next one was to serve on the Senate's athletics committee, mm -hmm. and I think I did that from uh, 64, 65, 96, you know, Started in 1984 uh, and was serving on the committee still when the athletic scandal broke in the fall of 1986. And uh, the uh, Senate's Athletic Committee was in no position to make mm -hmm. any serious contribution at all. 
Was Lonnie we, chairing the committee at that time? Lonnie was the president's representative. Oh. The NCAA requires that, that the president yeah. send a representative to NCAA meetings. That was his role. Dick Heitzenrader from oh. uh, theology was the, was the, the chair. chair. And uh, uh, so we had a, a theologian and a religious yeah. studies <laughs> uh, man uh, being lied to by, yeah. <laughs> by the athletics uh, administration, by the, uh, the athletic director and, uh, and others, but particularly the athletic director, about what, uh, what was going on. Uh, and it was it was a pretty pretty demoralizing period uh, for uh, for a lot of people and and in some sense the Senate seemed to resent the fact mm -hmm. that we could be of no particular <laughs> help. <to> help. <laughs> <laughs> I think over time uh, people understood mm -hmm. that uh, you know you you we yeah. were really in no position. Mm -hmm to uh, go behind what we were being told, told. Uh, yeah. by the yeah, by, by the athletics administration very sad business uh, that was that was mid 80s uh, let me say one thing Jim I think from an, a very sad business at one point of view but I think the sense of the university somehow enduring that and not being seriously crippled by it was uh, I think, rather admirable. Yes. Uh, Willis yes. willing to step in that, and, uh, that and, and uh, the role of the Senate uh, trying to preserve a kind of uh, right. open form of decency. And oh, and I think what uh, Leroy Howe did as, as president of the Faculty Senate uh, was, was extraordinarily valuable, as uh, were Bill Stalkup's contributions in the hot seat. Uh, for what two years? Yes, Maybe I think I think years. Was nearly two years. Uh, and uh, that was that was a that was a really rough period. Uh, but out of it, we got uh, we got a president with uh, a national reputation mm -hmm. for uh, uh, constructive leadership mm -hmm. and probity. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, Across the edge, maybe. But, uh, <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> totally. Yeah. No but, question about uh, Ken's integrity. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, no, I, I I would agree. I, I think in 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 the long haul, uh, well, we'd rather it hadn't happened. But oh, uh, yeah. in yeah. some respects, yeah. what it did for uh, for shaking up the governance mm -hmm. of the university mm -hmm. uh, was was very good and probably would not have happened absent that. Kind Hard of, to think of it kind of would. Of and right. The way the different people on the board reacted, some <laughs> ducking for cover and others right. uh, taking the flack and uh, yeah. uh, some, I guess, engineering their reorganization or eliminating the Board of Governors and uh, things of that sort. I, I never had right. a first-hand knowledge of just right. how that went. but. Uh, I had a sense the fellow named Bill Hutchinson was pretty critical in this and felt rather bruised by his experience. I think there were there were a lot of bruises mm -hmm. on out of that uh, on on the board, and I, you know, I think most of them just shut up yeah. and, <laughs> and took their lumps. Uh, anyway, in 1990, Barbara Reagan ran for re-election as an at-large senator. Mm -hmm. And uh, then discovered after <laughs> after her election that Ken Pai was not going to let her stay on past age seventy. Yeah. I think was the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the new retirement new retirement age. Age. There, there, <laughs> that that uh, uh, universities had yeah. been uh, had been exempted back in what was it 1985 that the or earlier than that, Congress passed a law saying that nobody could retirement. be forced to be retired for age, and then they exempted airline pilots yeah. and university yeah. professors and, and a few other yeah. categories. Uh, and then the the university uh, exemption ran out yeah. in yeah. the late 1980s. Well, I was in that contingent the last birth year that was uh, 
had right. a compulsory retirement. I remember right. Larry and Bott calling me rather apologetically to make sure I understood that was the case. <laughs> Uh, yeah. That must have been difficult for Narayan. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to get a hard time. I <laughs> right. had five more years than I thought I'd had before. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, uh, anyway, Bar Barbara mm -hmm. had to retire, which meant that she couldn't serve that yeah. term, uh, which meant that, in effect, the Senate Executive yeah. Committee went looking for someone mm -hmm. to take that post because running a re-election at yeah. large yeah. is complicated <laughs> at SNU. Yeah. Uh, and they asked me, and I said yes. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing they asked me was, well, would you serve on the, uh, uh, I think it was the, uh, the committee that yeah. recruits people to serve on committees? And I said, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and. Before I was even yeah. sworn yeah. in as a member of the Senate, they changed their minds about that and put me on the executive committee, uh, which is a, a small yeah. group of uh, the, the president yeah. and the, uh, the president-elect yeah. and the immediate past president and the Senate s secretary yeah. elected from the membership and three other, three or four other members yeah. elected from the Senate. So they put me up for that, and I started off yeah. with a bang in the Senate, sitting uh, sitting on XCOM, which I did mm -hmm. for nine years in one mm -hmm. capacity or another. Uh, and I, you know, I, I got a whole new view <laughs> of, <laughs> of the university. Uh, talked to different people, talked to some of the same people, yeah. uh, in a, in very different capacities, and. Uh, uh, you know, came to the conclusion fairly early on that uh, there there isn't a lot that the Senate can do to change the administration's mind once they've announced something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, that's very difficult. But as my colleague Brad Carter kept reminding me, he said, you know, the most important thing the faculty Senate does is to persuade the administration not to do things mm -hmm. they're thinking about doing. <laughs> and you sometimes get some advanced and knowledge with this. Right. Sometimes get some advanced knowledge. Well, the very first year was an excellent example. Uh, in uh, late September, early October, the chair of the Benefits Committee came in to talk to XCOM and, and advise us of plans on mm -hmm. the part of the administration that they were going to scrap the whole medical plan mm -hmm. for the university and in institute a single network plan. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, we just talked about that a little bit and said, can't do that, <laughs> right? Uh, better not do that. Yeah. And uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, yeah. that I played any particularly strong role in what happened next, it was it was mostly uh, David Johnson, who was mm -hmm. uh, president of the Senate at that time, uh, working with working with the administration and you know gnawing mm -hmm. at their heels for mm -hmm. for uh, six weeks or so. And when the new plan came out, they were willing the to old back one up was, a bit. They were willing to back up and keep keep the old plan, grandfather the old plan. And uh, offer some alternatives to the uh, to the network in, in terms of HMO choices uh, turned out very well. Uh, we got concerned about admissions, the admissions process, and uh, uh, fairly quickly uh, began a process of injecting the Senate. Uh, or representatives of the Senate, people responsible to the Senate, into the admissions process, uh, not just for athletes, but for, for, for all the students. And what we came up with eventually was a, uh, a, an interesting scheme of overlapping the Provost's Admissions Council, mm -hmm. which includes administrators, mm -hmm. with a Senate subcommittee on, ad on admissions, so the, the faculty members of the admissions council come from that committee, and the chair of the council mm -hmm. comes from that committee. 
Uh, we repeated that in uh, athletics mm -hmm. and uh, repeated it uh, again uh, in the Benefits Council. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, a, there's a now a good, uh, fairly reliable interlock between mm -hmm. those administration committees, mm -hmm. administrative committees, and the, and the faculty, faculty Senate, Senate, and the faculty Senate uh, can keep itself informed uh, on, mm -hmm. on what's going on and, and get a little advance mm -hmm. notice of mm -hmm. things that are that the administration thinks yeah. would be a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they are great yeah. ideas and sometimes uh, they need a little work. Trying on. Right? Yeah. A, little, a little trying on. Uh, but that was that was good fun. I, I, uh, uh, I had worked on some some committees before that uh, that brought me in contact with people from other parts of the university, and uh, certainly the Senate did that. And uh, does it make uh, too much difference who, who's the president of the Senate, or is it uh, enough momentum going so that? It's, I, doesn't I don't think it makes a lot of difference. So I, I think probably if you talk to university presidents, they found themselves more comfortable yes. with some than, than with others. Uh, Leora Howe made a huge difference, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that very many other people mm -hmm. could have handled mm -hmm. that situation in, in the wake of the, the athletic scandal uh, as, as well as he did. There may have been somebody who could have done it better, but I can't imagine. Mm -hmm who it would have been or how it, how yeah. it would have been done. Uh, but in the, in the general running of, of the university, uh, I don't think it makes a lot, I don't think it makes a lot of difference. For one thing, uh, a Senate president does have to persuade that executive committee that mm -hmm. this is a good idea mm -hmm. to take to the, to the whole Senate. And I can remember one instance, and I will not mention the contents, <laughs> right, uh, in which uh, uh, I decided it would be a good idea to take something to the whole Senate and persuaded the executive committee and uh, got roundly voted down, including by about half of my executive committee when, when the whole Senate met on, met on this. It was a fairly minor matter, a matter more of protocol than anything else. and. Uh, in that case, uh, being Senate president really didn't make a heck of a lot of difference. But we now have an arrangement since the, uh, uh, again, in the wake of the athletic scandal, where the, the, uh, the president of the Senate sits as a voting member of the board. Uh, I don't think that that makes a lot of difference to the board, but it does give a channel of insight uh, for the for the Senate and the faculty more generally to uh, to the board, uh, there are other uh, Senate uh, Senate appointed representatives on the on each of the board committees. Uh, so I, I think that kind of that kind of interchange is is a lot stronger than it used to be, and I think it's a good thing. I think it's very useful. Uh, not so much for day-to-day -day decision making, but for trying to anticipate where problems mm -hmm. uh, problems can arise, uh, and maybe even occasionally suggest mm -hmm. a good idea. Uh, the uh, <coughs> the one thing that the Senate the, has not been very successful at, I think, is. Uh, or as successful as one might hope, is, is reducing the, the tension and competitive relationships that grow up among the schools in the, in the university. Uh, they, uh, uh, it just, it, 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 it just doesn't work, and it comes out on things like calendar decisions. Yes. Uh, you know, all those really, really <laughs> vital, all that really vital decision making. Uh, that uh, that the Senate is supposed to take care of. Uh, there's some things you just can't do with the academic calendar uh, because uh, one portion of the of the university just doesn't want to fit that, uh, that that particular way of doing things. Uh, we did, on the other hand, I don't know if it's still true, but I know when when I was sitting in an executive committee, 
we heard that the, uh, the, the business school was going to uh, uh, reduce its undergraduate schedule to match its graduate schedule to uh, four days Wednesday, a week. Yeah. Monday, Wednesday, and yeah. Tuesday, yeah. Thursday uh, proposition. And we raised some objection to that. And I guess it got postponed. Yeah. I think it has actually happened. It's you know, happened. Uh, which uh, the problem with that, of course, is that it makes it very difficult for business majors to take courses mm -hmm. elsewhere yeah. in other than the business school. Uh, reduces their reduces their opportunities to to do that. Uh, which I think is is too bad. I can remember back in the in the eighties when our under in political science undergraduate enrollment and majors were burgeoning mm. and maybe you know a good mm. portion of our majors were double majoring in business. Mm. And we were able to be persuasive mm. to to them to come and double major yeah. in political science because we would pay some attention mm. to them yeah. right, and yeah. give them an opportunity to come in and talk to a yeah. faculty member, which they weren't yeah. really. Yeah. My impression yeah. was they weren't getting very much, much of that. that. Mm. Uh, their advising was uh, was all done by uh, by staff. Uh, I think that's, I, mm. I'm pretty sure that's still true, uh, which I never thought was quite right at a university that charges as much tuition as this one does to uh, not involve the faculty in, in advising. Would you want to say anything about your own relation to students, advising or otherwise? Well, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I made some notes on that I headed up as uh, Adventures in Advising. Okay. And uh, I'm just going to mention, mention a little bit of this. Uh, at, at least into the late 1990s, or maybe even a little past that, uh, the political science department really did give more than lip service to the notion mm -hmm. that faculty were supposed mm -hmm. to advise mm -hmm. undergraduates. And we got pretty good cooperation across the faculty. Mm -hmm. I think that's maybe less true with some of the newer folks coming yeah. in who would rather uh, that the department administrator did as much <laughs> of, this, <laughs> of this as possible. Uh, I'm I'm sorry to see to see that go. Uh, in the uh, in the early '80s, when Dedman College enrollment was imploding, collapsing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dean Hal Williams sat down with the dean of the business school, whose whose name escapes me now, and they worked out a deal on something to be called the three plus two program. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether you ever were. That I don't was think you were involved in that. Just after my time, yeah, involved in that at all. Yeah. Uh, the idea was that an, a student could uh, major in a Dedman College discipline uh, and uh, work to complete all of the uh, general education requirements mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of the departmental requirements for that major in the first three mm -hmm. years and apply to the business school for, for admission as an MBA student. This was as the business school was was mm -hmm. going from a, uh, uh, an el a 13 month, uh, excuse me, an, an 11 month intensive mm -hmm. MBA to a two year mm -hmm. uh, more traditional MBA program. Uh, so they'd spend a year as both an undergraduate and a graduate and then uh, a year finishing off the MBA. Well, uh, looked like a great idea in, in about 1983 or 4. But by the time the first group of undergraduates, yeah. oh, and, and uh, I was asked yeah. to, uh, to yeah. direct yeah. this program, <laughs> right? coordinate yeah. this program. Right? Uh, and uh, I talked to a lot of students about yeah. this program yeah. over the, the succeeding nearly, nearly a uh, good, good part of 10 years, not quite a decade. Uh, by the time the first group of students reached that three-year point and were ready to apply to the business school, mm -hmm. the business school didn't yet have its mm -hmm. two-year mm -hmm. MBA program. So we worked out a deal and one person actually applied and was accepted 
and they handcrafted a two-year yeah. MBA program for this guy. It worked out just yeah. fine. They're, they were happy with yeah. it. Uh, they, uh, uh, there were only ever w one, maybe two other people who were accepted by the business mm -hmm. school. Uh, the business schools, as, as you know, as I came to understand over time, their motive for entering into this deal in the first place was that they were afraid that their enrollments were going to be a little thin right. for the new two-year MBA right. program, uh, <coughs> given the popularity of the 11-month yeah. of the intensive program. Uh, and, and that turned out not to be true. And uh, once they, that disappeared, that they, that that motivation uh, just right. just disappeared entirely. They got a new dean who was not thrilled yeah. <laughs> with the idea, and their faculty weren't thrilled with the idea. Uh, so, uh, so only a handful they, of students uh, that were really good. Well, right, and yeah. and uh, these students were also expected to pick up some uh, some of the preliminary courses that the business mm -hmm. school expects of its Bachelor of Business mm -hmm. Administration students. Uh, the right economics yeah. course, the right mm -hmm. math uh, 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 math course, uh, and so forth. And once they'd done that, yeah. why it was just as easy to go ahead and do the VBA. And no amount of talking I could do yeah. could persuade them uh, <coughs> that, that uh, uh, it didn't make a lot of sense to do a four-year BBA yeah. if you're going to do a two-year MBA yeah. later on. So uh, uh, the program uh, just eventually petered out, <laughs> petered out completely. Uh, but in the meantime, I met a lot of really very interesting students <laughs> and, uh, and did, did put my oar in from time to time, and maybe one or two of them are persuaded to, you know, to stick, with the, stick with Dedman College. Uh, I got in real trouble with, <coughs> with Dean Buddy Gray when I let him know that, uh, uh, that I was telling yeah. the very brightest kids especially that uh, you know the really very strongest MBA programs around the country would just soon not have BBA yeah. undergraduates yeah. coming yeah. to them, yeah. right? And uh, uh, but he didn't like that. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't like that very much. We we had that was one of the differences. Yeah. <laughs> buddy, buddy and I had. Uh, but uh, it was it was it was fun to do, but it was it was also frustrating. A lot a lot more fun to do, uh, although sometimes equally frustrating was uh, the Truman Scholarship uh, program. Uh, the Harry Truman Scholarships are n national competitions. Uh, the scholarship awards come in the spring of the junior year. You must have a full undergraduate year left uh, to be able to accept the scholarship. And in the early years, when this started in the late, I think 1979 was our first Truman Scholar, was the first round of Truman Scholarships. Diane Norton won one, and uh, for the next 10 years or so, we were on one on an average of one a year. Uh, Tom Arp was chairing a committee uh, and running the program. Tom decided that he didn't want to do this anymore and uh, asked. Uh, eventually it fell into, my, fell into my lap. And I did it for five, six, seven years, something like that. Uh, by that time, lots more colleges and universities had caught on yeah. to this neat deal. And the competition was a, a little was hard a lot to different. maintain our uh, but, uh, we did have some, uh, so we, we still had some successes. And, uh, and just meeting these students and working with them uh, mm -hmm. on a, uh, a fairly challenging application process mm -hmm. and uh, getting a few of them to be interviewed uh, in, uh, in regional interviews. What that, would they characteristically do once they got the scholarship? Uh, the, I think the idea of the Truman Foundation, the preference of the Truman Foundation would be that they would do their graduate work uh, in, a, in some kind of a public policy, public administration graduate program. 
most of the students wanted to go to law school, right? So for, for, for a while, uh, the foundation just discouraged uh, recommending yeah. pre-law students. Uh, then they said, uh, well, we'll consider mm. pre-law students if they're also going to do yeah. a, a second postgraduate yeah. degree. And I think they're back now to saying, uh, oh, gee, you know, uh, they uh, will we'll, we'll take will take pre-law yeah. students, but they probably they ought to be able to give us a good case yeah. about their intentions regarding uh, regarding public service uh, as at least a first career, yeah. right? Uh, and something of, something other than thinking about running for sheriff <laughs> of, <laughs> of the home <laughs> county or uh, something of that sort. So these were very very bright students uh, in. Uh, in, in a lot of places, uh, well, in my undergraduate school at West Point, they'd send students out to compete for Truman Scholarships and uh, then send them out next year to compete for Rhodes and Marshall Scholarships, and there's a lot of over, a lot of over. So people there. get both? People can get both, that's right. And I don't quite know how, how that works out because they're very different funding sources. Yeah, I wouldn't think uh, you'd need a Truman things. Scholarship if you got a Rhodes. Well, <laughs> uh, but if you, uh, you know, if you go off to a Rhodes Scholarship, you come back with uh, sort of an honorary MA, yeah. right? And then you go to then you go, go to, to you go to graduate law school, school or graduate school or or, yeah. or whatever. You've got that Truman yeah. Scholarship with uh, another, still twenty seven thousand dollars left to yeah. subsidize you over two or three years. Yeah. Uh, that's not a bad no, not a bad no. deal. Uh, but. Uh, the, uh, of, of course, the tough, the tough thing was, was identifying students uh, who could present themselves credibly as having an interest in a public service mm -hmm. career. That's not something that S the at SMU uh, uh, I won't say SMU, but it's not something that the, the atmosphere at SMU really mm -hmm. encourages mm -hmm. students to to think very much, very much about uh, the. Uh, it's just not part of the the ambiance here mm -hmm. that people think in terms mm -hmm. of public service careers. I know, you know a number of SMU graduates end up yeah. uh, doing significant public service, but it's not the kind of thing that's. I don't think it's the kind of thing they talk about very much around the table no. in the fraternity no. houses and the sorority, <laughs> sorority houses and, and and what have you. Uh, just doesn't just doesn't happen yeah. that way. But uh, that that I enjoyed a good bit, and then uh, there was the there's the lacrosse club. Yeah. Uh, back in I'd been here about two or three years, I guess when. Uh, a couple of kids walked into my American <laughs> government class one afternoon <laughs> sporting T-shirts that said SMU yeah, lacrosse. lacrosse. So I stopped them on the way yeah. out of the of class and I said, that, that's a great joke. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any idea what it means? I said, no, 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 it's not a joke. There, we yeah. have a club team. Yeah. Uh, come on out. Yeah. We have our last game on Saturday. So I went out and, and Had you had any game. connection with lacrosse other than knowing what it I was? I played lacrosse uh, one season as a third string defenseman on an intramural team. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I went to West Point and it was every man an athlete whether you yeah. were or not. I wasn't, so uh, I was, uh, right? <laughs> and uh, on, on intramural teams, yeah. you couldn't play the same sport yeah. twice. So uh, oh. I, I did a season of, yeah. of lacrosse. But I love the game as a spectator. It, it was a, I think it's, uh, it's my favorite spectator yeah. sport. Uh, well, I think it'd be terribly taxing physically uh, to be. Oh up and well, up. yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, even more so than basketball. Say. A good deal more, a good deal uh, uh, rougher than yeah. basketball, except maybe pro basketball. Yeah. <laughs> That's those big guys yeah. moving around on throwing the, elbows, on the court, <laughs> throwing elbows, and what have you. Uh, uh, physical in a different way from uh, from football. Uh, physical, more like hockey. Uh, it doesn't move quite as fast as hockey. It moves a lot faster than soccer. 
Yeah. Uh, anyway, the next fall, this uh, undergraduate, then a uh, starting his senior year, who had organized the club or reorganized yeah. it. I'm not quite sure of the ancient history of lacrosse at SMU, but uh, he had reorganized the club and was getting it, yeah. lining it up to uh, join the Southwest Lacrosse Association yeah. as a full uh, member, but it had to have university recognition. To get university yeah. recognition, they had to have a faculty advisor. Yeah. So he came by and talked me into signing the paperwork my agreement was that I would uh, sign their paperwork. I would even come to the games uh, as I could, but I would never pick up or get hit by a stick. <laughs> and uh, that, uh, uh, that's gone on for a long time. Uh, they're having a very good year, or had a very good year this year. We're having a very good year this year, run into a little rough times. And they no longer require a faculty yeah. advisor. The oh, they don't. The staff, uh, yes. some of uh, the uh, uh, student student yeah. life staff yeah. uh, have taken over those those yeah. sorts of duties, which is a good thing. There's one fellow who does this for all of the sports clubs oh. that are pretty much orphans at SMU. Yeah. Uh, they can't even get a guaranteed playing field here. Yeah. Uh, we have had to forfeit games from yeah. time to time for lack of a playing field. Well, we're fairly short on uh, playing we're, fields we're, and we're amateur we're athletics That's as right. opposed to semi-professional athletics. That's right. That's right. Uh, and of course, there's talk from time to time yeah. among the, yeah. the the team members about well, you know, if we yeah. if we do this yeah. real well yeah. this season, the athletic yeah. department's yeah. bound to pick yeah. us up. As yeah. <laughs> and I keep saying, no, no, yeah. <laughs> that is not going up. to happen, just not going yeah. to happen. Right? We'll have women's rugby yeah. before yeah. we have men's lacrosse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thanks very much, Jim. I think you've given well, it's us been a, a pleasure. good yeah. deal of information on several fronts, and uh, okay. particularly lacrosse. <laughs> 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 that may not <laughs> have been the topic I was supposed to go out on. Yeah, well, but, uh, it uh, seems like a good way to end. Good, good. And, uh, it has been a pleasure.